Alexander the Great, or Alexander III of Macedon, a king that was undefeated in battle, a king that was believed to be the divine son of the Greek god Zeus, a king that is today considered one of history's greatest military minds. Alexander the Great is the man who single-handedly created one of the largest empires of the ancient world, stretching from Greece to northwestern India in only about a decade, but more astoundingly, by the young age of 30. By no surprise, the life of Alexander the Great remains a legacy. His untimely death at the time he was at the prime of his power, however, is an unsolved mystery to this day. Join us as we dig deep into the life of this legendary king of Macedonia. But before we begin, take a second to like and subscribe to our channel. In the year 356 BC, in the Pella region of the ancient Greek kingdom of Macedonia, Alexander III was born to King Philip II of Macedon and Queen Olympia, daughter of King Neoptolemus. Raised in Pella's royal court, Alexander hardly ever saw his father, who spent most of his time engaged in military campaigns and extramarital affairs. Philip II was a military genius in his own right. He had turned Macedonia into a powerful force to be reckoned with, and his goals were to conquer the massive Persian Empire. In his absence, however, Leonidas of Epirus to tutor the young prince on math, horsemanship, and archery. But Alexander proved to be a rebellious, mischievous student. Failing at the task, another tutor was hired, Lysimachus, who cleverly used role-playing to capture young Alexander's attention. Alexander particularly enjoyed impersonating the warrior Achilles. At the age of 12, Alexander tamed a wild horse, Bucephalus, an enormous stallion with furious demeanor, but even at the age of 12, Alexander was no less courageous or intimidating. This horse would become his battle companion for most of his life. As for his tutors, by age 13, King Philip II called on the great philosopher Aristotle to do something about the boy. And finally then did Aristotle spark and foster Alexander's interest in literature, science, medicine, and philosophy and politics over the course of the next three years. Around the time Alexander was 16, his father left him in charge of Macedonia while he went off to war. But instead of looking after his kingdom, Alexander saw the opportunity to prove his military worth and led a cavalry against the sacred band of Thebes a supposedly unbeatable army. Alexander took charge of the champion cavalry and aided his father in defeating the Athenian and Theban armies at Chironia. But soon after King Philip had succeeded in his campaign to unite all the Greek states, excluding Sparta, into the Corinthian League, the alliance between him and Alexander was somewhat strained. Upon returning to Macedonia, King Philip married Cleopatra Eurydice, niece of General Attalus. The marriage made Alexander's position as heir less secure, since any son of Cleopatra would be a fully Macedonian heir, while Alexander was only half Macedonian. Alexander and Olympia were forced to flee Macedonia and stay with Olympia's family in Epirus until Alexander and King Philip reconciled their differences. In 336 BC, King Philip II was assassinated by his bodyguard, Pausanias. Just 19 at the time, Alexander was determined to seize the throne. He quickly gathered the support of the Macedonian army who had fought under him at Chironia. They proclaimed him as the feudal king and proceeded to help him eliminate other potential heirs to the throne. Some sources report Queen Olympia, an ever-loyal mother, further ensured her son's claim by slaughtering the daughter of King Philip II and driving Cleopatra to take her own life. But although Alexander claimed the Macedonian throne, he didn't obtain automatic control of the Corinthian League. 
The southern states of Greece expressed divided interests. Athens was looking to take charge of the League and began to launch independence movements. To counter these rebellions, Alexander sent his army south and coerced the regions of Thessaly into acknowledging him as the leader of the Corinthian League. Soon after, at a meeting of League members at Thermopylae, Alexander elicited their acceptance as his leadership. Treaties were then reissued with the Greek city-states that belonged to the Corinthian League, and Alexander was granted full military power. Now what? Alexander had similar goals as his father, to continue Macedonia's world domination. And the first major power to conquer would be Persia. Appointing the general Antipater as regent, Alexander embarked on his Asiatic expedition. He and his army crossed the Hellespont, a narrow strait between the Aegean Sea and the Sea of Marmara, and faced the Persian king Darius III's army near the Granicus River. The Persian army was swiftly defeated, and Alexander and the Macedonians continued on with their winning streak. Alexander then headed south and easily took the cities of Sardis and went for Miletus, Mylasa, and Halicarnassus. However, at the same time, King Darius hadn't accepted defeat and continued to amass an army. From Halicarnassus, Alexander headed north to Gordium, home of the fabled Gordian Knot. As the legend goes, the Phrygians were without a king, but an oracle at Telmisus decreed the next man to enter the city driving an ox cart should become their king. A peasant farmer named Gordius drove into town on an ox cart and was immediately declared king. Out of gratitude, his son Midas dedicated the ox cart to the Phrygian god Sabazios and tied it to a post with an intricate knot of cornel bark. The ox cart still stood in the palace of the former kings of Phrygia at Gordium in the 4th century BC, which point Phrygia had been conquered by the Persian Empire. Another oracle declared that any man who could unravel its elaborate knots was destined to become ruler of Asia. And so, when Alexander the Great arrived to Gordium and untied the knot by pulling the lint pinch from the yoke. But alternative sources also say he simply drew his sword and sliced it in half. Either way, legend or myth, Alexander would go on to fulfill the Phrygian prophecy. On with history. By 333 BC, King Darius had successfully gathered a massive army and faced Alexander near the town of Isis in southern Turkey. This time, Alexander's forces were greatly outnumbered, but not in experience or the determination to claim Persia's great wealth. Alexander was victorious once again, and Darius fled with whatever remained of his troops, even leaving his wife and family behind. Up next, Alexander took over the Phoenician cities of Marinus and Aridus, but this time Darius offered him a plea of peace, to which he rejected and continued on to take over Byblos and Sidon. Alexander then laid siege to the heavily fortified island of Tyre in 332 BC. But there was just a small issue here. Alexander had no navy, and Tyre was surrounded by water. So the military genius improvised and instructed his men to build a causeway to reach Tyre. The plan seemed to work at first, but as they reached close, the Tyrians thwarted his attempts to gain entry. Alexander realized this wasn't going to work without a strong navy. So, in a matter of months, he amassed a large fleet and finally breached the city's walls. And what followed after was the execution of thousands of Tyrians and many others sold into slavery for daring to defy Alexander. In late 333 BC, Alexander declared himself the king of Persia after capturing Darius and making him fugitive. With Persia in his hands, Alexander set out for Egypt. After a long siege on Gaza, Alexander easily achieved his conquest. Egypt fell without resistance. In 331, he created the city of Alexandria, designed as a hub for Greek culture and commerce. After conquering Egypt, however, Alexander had to face Darius again, who was out and about gathering his massive troops at Guagamela. This time, following a fierce battle with heavy losses on both sides, 
Darius fled, but couldn't escape even his own troops and was assassinated. Some accounts report Alexander grieved the Persian king's death, and when he found his body, he gave him a royal burial. With the collapse of the Persian army and no upcoming surprise attacks, Alexander was now known as King of Babylon, King of Asia, King of the Four Quarters of the World. Just as the Phrygian Oracle said, but there were others who wished to claim the Persian throne. Bessus, a Persian leader who was thought to be Darius's murderer. Alexander, however, quickly had him out of the way, sending his men in his pursuit. Bessus's troops themselves handed him over to Ptolemy, Alexander's good friend. And Bessus was then executed, giving Alexander full control of Persia. But to truly be king over the people, Alexander needed the mass public to accept him. So, to gain credibility with the Persians, Alexander took on many Persian customs. He dressed in Persian attire and adopted Persian royal court customs. The Macedonians, however, weren't so happy with these changes. Many of his men condemned him for adopting Persian customs and manners. They refused to practice them and even began plotting his death. Suspicious and paranoid, Alexander ordered the death of one of his generals, Parmenio, after his son was convicted in plotting the assassination. And like Parmenio, Clytus, another general of Alexander, also suffered a similar fate. Fed up with Alexander's new persona, he insulted Alexander in a drunken state. And when things became a bit too much for Alexander to handle, in a fit of rage, he took his life. Some historians believe Alexander did the deed in drunkenness, a persistent problem that plagued him throughout much of his life. In 327 BC, Alexander was on with his conquest of world domination and marched to Punjab, India. The following year, he clashed with King Porus of, of Parava at the Hydapus River. Porus's army was less experienced, but they had a secret weapon, elephants. It was during this time, Bucephalus died, either from battle wounds or of old age, and the horse's death devastated Alexander, and he named the city of Bucephala after him. After a fierce long battle, however, the Indian armies weren't able to defeat the undefeated. Alexander was victorious yet again, and he wished to conquer all of India. But his soldiers were at this point war-weary, and his officers convinced him to return to Persia. But before leaving, Alexander was quite impressed by Porus and reinstated him as king over the region. In early 324 BC, Alexander reached the city of Susa in Persia. There had been enough quarrels and rivalry between the Persians and Macedonians, and Alexander thought it time for unity, and also had some other world-dominating ideas going on. He wanted to merge the Persians and the Macedonians and create a new race that would be loyal only to him. And so, he ordered many of his officers to marry Persian princesses at a mass wedding. He also took a couple wives for himself. The Macedonian army resented Alexander's attempt to change their culture and many mutinied. Alexander, however, had never been someone to compromise. He took a firm stand and replaced Macedonian officers and troops with Persians. And as a result, his army finally backed down. To further defuse the situation, Alexander returned their titles and hosted a huge reconciliation banquet. Things were now going wrong. But around this time, Alexander's lifelong companion, Hephaestion, died. The loss devastated Alexander, and in his emotional state of grief and anger, he issued some rather unreasonable orders. He had the neighboring town of Kosan slaughtered as a sacrifice for his friend. He ordered immediate execution of Hephaestion's doctor for failing to cure him. And finally, declared a period of mourning throughout his empire. He then carried his friend's body to his funeral in Babylon, where he was buried with the rites of a king. Alexander truly went into depression. 
but thanks to his insatiable hunger for world domination, he started to overcome his grief and began planning to conquer Arabia. But he never lived to see it happen. After surviving battle after battle, Alexander the Great died in June 323 BC at the age of 32. Some historians say Alexander died of malaria he might have contracted when he was in India, while others say it was due to excessive drinking, a lifelong problem, and some believe he was poisoned. The true cause behind his death, however, remains a mystery, a strangely chilling one. According to historical accounts, after his death, Alexander's body didn't begin to show signs of decomposition for a full six days. Today, historians have come up with many plausible reasons, but back in 323 BC, to the ancient Greeks, it confirmed their belief that the young Macedonian king was no ordinary man, but a god. Some scholars and clinicians today recently came up with a new theory, saying that Alexander suffered from a neurological disorder known as the Gillian Barr syndrome this being the reason behind why his body might not have decayed, because he was not dead at all. Gillian-Barr syndrome is a rare neurological disorder which causes progressive paralysis which starts from the feet and progresses throughout the body of the affected person. It occurs when the immune system attacks the peripheral nerves in the body. Doctors at the time of Alexander relied mostly on the absence of breath to determine whether the patient was dead or not. And in the case of Alexander, who might have been suffering from Gillian-Barr syndrome, was probably paralyzed or in a deep coma. And if we say maybe he was assassinated and didn't have any disease, then in that case, his body would have decayed like any normal person. So, Alexander the Great may not have died when we thought he died. We were only led to believe he was. Of all the theories, this seems to be the most logical one, though there is no way to prove anything anymore. Either way, Alexander the Great never named a successor, and after his untimely death, his empire he'd fought so hard to create collapsed, and the nations within it battled for power. But his reign is still remembered today as a turning point in European and Asian history. His campaigns greatly increased contact and trade between East and West, allowing Greek civilization and influence to spread. Some of the cities he founded survive to this day a memory of the once powerful and influential ruler of the ancient world. If you liked our video, don't forget to subscribe and follow our channel for more videos like this one.